is a bit of a fly past, really. You know, that they are on their way around southern Ireland and, uh, and then sort of turning, turning right and then up the, up the west coast of the Emerald Isle. But right now, it is all about this challenging transition because the wind is funneling down, uh, down both coasts, uh, the east and the west coast of Ireland at the moment. Now that we're approaching the south end, there's this sort of confluence and there's a little bit of sort of almost wake turbulence of the island uh, of the, <laughs> the island of Ireland um, that uh, is, is meaning that they're sailing in such light conditions and jiving downwind, as you can see here. And it's certainly pretty light, light enough to want to put a crew member up the rig. I think that's Daryl Wislang up there at the moment, looking for breeze. He's looking for breeze and also up there uh, on standby, ready to kick the top of the mainsail through from jive to jive, as we've seen several times in light conditions like this. If you do do a maneuver, uh, then there's not enough um, momentum or inertia as, as the sail goes from one side to the other to pop the batten through. And this, uh, I mean, this is light. This is slow going at the moment, as we can see. Jack Boutel, other crew members as well, up on the bow, getting the trim down forward. They're not moving very fast right now, under five knots. Um, but... This is going to be a big moment. As you say, a transition. What kind of wind speeds are we going to be expecting them to see once we clear this corner of uh, the Republic of Ireland? Yeah, well, it's a you know, very, very different picture. that this, um, this race is going to be a study in contrast. Uh, if you're watching now, I invite you to join us later for the Daily Live at 1300 UTC when we're going to be going into a little bit more detail. But basically, they're going to come around. Uh, they're going to get out of the wind shadow. They're going to get out of the high-pressure zone. Uh, and they're going to be uh, tacking upwind in as much as 20 knots up the west coast of Ireland. Well, let's take a quick look at the virtual eye and the position of the fleet at the moment. And this is just a, a, a rough picture right now. We've got a Dongfeng race team, as you can see on the leaderboard, out in the lead with Team Brunel in second place, not by much, about a mile and a half behind. Then we've got Mafre in third place. Then it's Team Axe Nobel. Turn the tide on plastic with Vesta Selim with our racing right alongside them. And then some good miles back, unfortunately, Sun Hung Kai Scalawag had got off to a little bit of a shaky start out of Cardiff. That's uh, where the fleet are at the moment uh, on the water. But as we say, we've got live images out there, and you can take a look at the tracker as we go. The tracker is uh, live uh, on the website. You can have a little bit of a look. And if you've been just joining us for the Volvo Ocean Race, well, the good news is that the tracker is set to remain live all the way to that last finish line in The Hague. But... Right now, as the boats are close to the shore and close to where we can get the helicopter out, it is out there flying. Have a little bit of a look. And these are the boats that are chasing down Dongfeng race team at the moment. We were taking a look at the Chinese boat just a moment ago, but on the right-hand side of our picture, Team Brunel, the boat that everybody, quite rightly so, is talking about. This boat has come from far back in the rankings to now being very much within touch of claiming the overall title. Uh, well, well, very definitely. They're three points astray at the moment, and uh, this, is, this was done. This incredible charge up through the rankings was done with two victories uh, when it counted in the double points leagues. And so they did that first coming from uh, Auckland to Itajai and then finally the transatlantic league that we just finished on the way into Cardiff. Now, one thing I'd like to point out here is the boats are sailing... Uh, downwind with a true wind angle of about 130 or 140 even for, for Mafre. Now, it's interesting, for those of you that are, uh, that are at home and are perhaps more used with sailing to a, a spinnaker downwind, you know, a big, fluffy, round sail, uh, whereas here the boats are, are sailing with these masthead code zero. So it's the second biggest uh, head sail that is available in the inventory. But... As we've seen pretty consistently, that is the faster sail in reaching and in downwind in comparison to the A3, the bigger sail. Um, but in actually, paradoxically, in the lighter winds, you need a smaller, flatter sail because the boat is going pretty much the same speed as the wind, even though you're going downwind. And so actually, you're sheeting on quite significantly, which means that you've got quite uh, tight, apparent wind angles, even though you're trying to soak down and, you're, and the boats are actually jiving uh, downwind if you look at the tracker. So they are in full downwind mode, and you can see a few changes in the setup here. As we go to turn the tide on plastic and vessels of power racing, uh, we've got J3 and the J2, so two smaller uh, headsails. Um, so sitting in there, in, in, in behind the, um, uh, the, the bigger masthead code zero. If you remember when we started with shots of, um, 
of Dongfeng race team. Initially, they had their J3 out, then they filled it up, and so there's this constant balance, this constant juggling as to what is the right sail plan, and as they sort of go in and out around the headlands and we've got small shifts and small increases or decreases of winds, that's something that they're going to be constantly playing with. And this is the view that they're trying to get by climbing the mast, isn't it? Because we've got a great shot right now down over the racetrack with Vestas 11th hour racing, turn the tide on plastic, chasing the other boats ahead of them. We can see those dark patches. We can see those little bit of breeze that they'll be trying to, to link up with those maneuvers. But every maneuver, it's going to cost them distance and speed. It does cost them, and it's a big tactical option whether you stay on, um, on port as they are now, which is giving them a pretty good angle uh, out towards the west uh, as they continue on. And so, uh, but it's, so it's also a mix of, you're exactly right, looking for ripples on the water, saying where the pressure is, and then feeding that into the calculus of um, am I trying to go, uh, go to the west or going for, for better pressure? Tactically, where am, I, where am I in the fleet? And because we, we've seen Dongfeng do plenty of maneuvers here. They've been, they've been under pressure from behind. They came into this a few hours ago with four miles uh, of, of cushion. They, they have come up to preserve their lead and uh, sort of do the old, the old school trick of staying between you and the, and the mark so they can't be overtaken. But that has cost them. And also, the boat out in the lead is the first one to get the fluky breeze in the, in the turbine behind the islands. Well, th what we're seeing right now on the virtual tracker, I think, is an interesting point to back that up because Dongfeng Race Team putting in these little double extra jibes. I mean, when you look at some of the tracks of the boats behind them, it's been fairly solid. They've just been following them. Whereas Dongfeng Race Team electing to put in extra maneuvers, trying, I mean, I'm guessing, just to lock down the boats behind and say, well, we're just going to position ourselves bang in front close down the opportunity for things to go wrong for the Chinese boats. Yeah, that's right. It's been uh, a hard, f well, it must be painful to go from four miles ahead to you know, 1.6 <laughs> now. That's, that's certainly going to be, be stressful, and certainly they're, they're going to be casting an eye behind them and uh, hoping that they can stave off the chase. But it is really a, really a case of making those, uh, that small advantage count, that, that basically what they had before was four miles, but they were further to the south. Now, that allowed them... Um, to, to look great in the rankings, but actually they were a little bit vulnerable because uh, it allowed a passing lane for the other boats. So what they've done now is they've invested that lead and they've, they've shut the door on everybody else. So now that, that 1.6 miles of lead that they have is pure lead. And then afterwards they can take tactical options uh, to decide what they want to do with it. Now we've got our uh, daily live show coming up in a, about an hour and 15 minutes. And I know that we're gonna talk about it in a lot more detail there, but I just wanna hit you with one question at the moment. As we're seeing with the boats on the water, the order that they're in, Dongfeng Race Team leading, Team Brunel second, Mafrey third. At the moment, who does this benefit? I mean, I'm guessing Dongfeng Race Team, they're gonna be pretty happy leading right now. But it's not just about the top three boats, is it? You know, we need to see those back markers come in, or at least I should say, if we do see those back markers come into the mix, things get interesting. Yes, very definitely. When, once you start placing other boats, for example, uh, other boats that have get, got a great turn of speed that have developed during the course of the race, like Vessels Them Thou Racing or, or, um, or Team X Nobel, uh, if, if they start to mix it up with the, the boats that are in the, on the podium position in the overall, then that will start really shuffling the positions. Because if you know, we've got a one-point lead at the moment uh, with Dongfeng over this boat here, the Spanish Mafre, they're working hard to chase, the, to chase down their, uh, their, their colleagues. But um, if they do and they win the leg, or, or maybe Mafre goes second and Dongfeng goes goes third, then they're back to tied. There's only that small delta, that small difference between the fleets. However, if Mafre gets second and Dongfeng gets fifth, then woohoo, you know. <laughs> uh, first of all, we're going to see a grumpy shawl, and that's always interesting. Um, but then otherwise, we're, you know, it's going to be all to play for. So uh, that's why these top three boats, the top three boats that you see out on the water and also in the overall standings, are going to be watching each other like a hawk. And it's particularly painful right now when you see the boats grind to a halt. Well, let's just talk a little bit about what we're seeing at the moment because there's some activity on the foredeck. We just got a glimpse a moment ago, one of the furled sails coming down onto the deck. So they're only right now sailing with a masthead code zero in the main. Earlier on, turn the tide on plastic, Vesta Slimith Hour Racing, they look like they had three head sails up. So a little bit of a difference uh, in choice at the moment and certainly some activity going on. 
Yeah, that's right. They, they could be, uh, well, actually, we, we just saw um, Altadin, uh, Guillermo Altadin's uh, son, um, an ex extremely experienced uh, Sp Spanish sailor and actually sort of one of the family legacy in the Volvo Ocean Race. There, he was, he was packing away the J3. We can see that in the, uh, in the sail, uh, strapping away the, the halyards onto the mast. So clearly they're committing to dropping these sails down. Uh, and the advantage there is that uh, you clean up the windage so you don't have so much, um, so much turbulence on the boat itself. So that cleans up the air for that masthead code zero and uh, makes it more efficient, particularly in these light breezes. Also allows you to get the weight further forward. So instead of having the weight dangling up in, up in the mast, you can really wham it way, way forward. That helps get the stern out and, um, and helps uh, Pablo Arate on the back of the boat um, get, uh, get a better grip with the rudders. Well, so it might paint a little bit of a picture about what's happening with the breeze. If turn the tide on plastic, Vestas, they think uh, that they've got enough breeze to fly those sails then maybe these boats here that we're seeing at the front uh, with Mafre and now Team Brunel as well, with just the masthead code zero, maybe they're sailing into a little bit of a lighter patch just going around the rock, but what a fantastic shot at the moment. I'm wondering whether Team Brunel have got anybody up the rig. I can't see anybody hiding behind the head of the main at the moment. Certainly did on Dongfeng Race Team. Did as well on Mafre, but Team Brunel right now, it looks like crew down on the deck with the fast net rock and the lighthouse just in front of them. It's not a mark of the course, and uh, they were free not to go anywhere near it. However, the current routing has put them pretty close to it, which means that we've been able to get the helicopter out, and also some ribs as well. I see some fans out there on the water getting a little chance just to follow the racing up close, but it is light at the moment. It's very light, and it is very close between the fleet. Between Dongfeng Race Team in the lead and Team Brunel, as we're watching at the moment, the lead has shortened to just over one nautical mile. And as you were saying a moment ago, Conrad Bauer, Becky on the helm, he would have been looking forward and seeing the Chinese team four miles ahead. And while it might be that Charles Cordrelia and Dongfeng race team have put themselves in a solid position, nice now for Team Brunel to have them within their grasp. Very much so, particularly in the, in the um, light and fluky winds that the fleet is currently experiencing. Um, that you can see these sort of these dark bands in the water there between the, our helicopter and the fast net rock. So that that is a little bit of a wind shift. That's a bit of a puff. And e you know if you get that or you miss it, then you know the whole race could hinge on that one moment. So it's absolutely crucial. And it's it's pretty cool to see uh, Bauer Beckin there helming his ship to uh, <laughs> potentially you know another another victory. He's clearly taking matters into his own hands. Um, yeah, but uh, but otherwise. Uh, Looking, looking good, and these images are just so spectacular. And of course, this moment as the fleet sail around the Fastnet Rock, it's something that's been on the build for a while, and the rock is an iconic moment for any sailor, and uh, that was what we were talking about when we spoke to Abby Elia earlier on as Team Brunel approached this fantastic landmark in offshore racing. It is iconic, as you said, uh, for the renowned race that we, d we do around it. Um, so I'm surprised how flat the water is at the moment because usually this is a pretty horrific place to be uh, with the sea state and the shallow water, but we're enjoying really pleasant sailing conditions. And I'll give you a chance to tone down the modesty because I believe that you won the Fastnet race before. Yeah, I did. I won it on board uh, Enigma, which was owned by Charles Dunson, uh, Michael Pugh 76, and uh, we managed to beat Rambler that year. Again, quite a light, light year, but um, yeah. We won it. Fantastic. <laughs> I'm imagining a little bit strange for all the sailors that might have done the fast net race before to get to the rock in this direction and keep going. It's going to be a little bit strange. Yeah, almost. I mean, I, I think um, leading up to it, there was... ...on board Team Brunel, are just talking a little bit about what the fast net rock and what the race means to her. but. A little bit of an interesting moment there because we were looking uh, at that interview. We saw the images during that interview. It wasn't that long ago. They were obviously sailing in much, much better breeze. And this is difficult now, sailing, as you say, trying to make a proper downwind course with a code zero. Difficult to get that sail to set. It is. It, particularly because you can see even just the small waves that you can see move the boat around. And if you look at the luff right now, and or, or generally the, the, the shape of that sail, it is 
sort of flying all over the place, and every small movement that the hull makes then it is amplified by the mast, and then the mast shakes the sails, and the sails shake the wind out of, out of them. So you end up losing forward drive just with the smallest ripple on the water. And so that's why um, this, the sea state is so crucial when you've got um, so little wind like that. And so um, it's, it's so interesting to be going, as you said in that interview, uh, going past the, uh, the fast net rock. Normally you do a U-turn on, on Plymouth. Indeed, since 1925, this has been the sort of roadhouse almost, a, a cultural <laughs> phenomenon for ocean racing sailors uh, the world over. Uh, but now the sailors have got 1,064 miles to go uh, around Ireland, uh, around the, the top of Scotland, and then finally in, into Gothenburg. So um, they're not going to be heading back to Bergson ships for the Plymouth tonight, that's for sure. Well, it's going to be light winds for the teams at the moment as they navigate their way past the fast net rock. And on from there, as we were saying, there is plenty of racing left to go. And later on today, in around about an hour's time, we're going to be back with you. 1300 UTC. We've got our daily show. We're going to be taking a look at the scores as they are, what combinations will affect the scoreboards, how it is that Team Brunel are going to be caught. They are certainly up and coming right now. The Dongfeng race team, they are in the lead. But as we're saying, the back markers have got a crucial role to play. Join us at 1300 UTC when we're going to dive into everything that's happening out in the race course.